Good afternoon and welcome to today's uni for me session. Um, and we've got two presentations for you this afternoon. First, we've got um, Tim Lane from Liverpool John Moores University, uh, who's going to be talking to us about climate change. And then we've got a video to play you from Amity University from Lujan Rosales, um, which talks basically about why you should consider um, studying geography at university. Uh, my name's Martin Webster. Um, I lead on the uh, Uni for Me website, which, in case you don't know, is a, an online site full of activities which are free for you to access. Um, all, all about higher education, different subjects, transition. And it's not just all about university, it's about education per se. Um, so there's lots of stuff on there for you to explore. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to Tim now, uh, who's going to take us through some exciting stuff about climate change. Over to you, Tim. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, I'll just share my screen. So hopefully you can see that. What I'm going to go through today is sort of a, what I've called a, a very brief introduction um, to climate change. I'm going to sort of go through a bit of a background about me, a bit about um, what climate is, what climate change is and effectively kind of summarize what the key things I'm working on are and some of the key issues we need to look, look at going forward. So if you are interested in any of this and you have further questions, my email's there and my, my Twitter handle, feel free to, to drop me an email. Um, and just if, if you have never seen this picture in the background, these, these are the so-called climate stripes designed by Ed Hawkins, a professor in the UK. And they basically show the, the average temperature um, from about, I think it's 100 or so years ago to present. So um, the past is on the left and present day is on the right. And unsurprisingly, darker red colours are warmer, uh, blue colours are, are colder. And you can see just by looking, and this is, these are the climate stripes for England specifically, not for any other part of the world. You can see generally, apart from a few very warm years in the past and a few cold years recently, um, we clearly have a, a lot of warming going on recently. Um, which was formerly it was called sort of global warming. We now call it climate change. Uh, it's a bit less of a sort of emotional word. So I um, go forward. I'm a, a sort of scientist who works in physical geography. That's my degree. Uh, I studied at a few different universities before I came to work at Liverpool John Moores University. And this is me from an, an early age. You can see I was obsessed with snow. This is probably the one time it snowed when I was younger. Um, and I mainly work in Greenland. Uh, where I did my PhD. Uh, this is me posing with a fish we caught while we were camping out there for sort of six weeks on our own. And some more recent work I did in the sort of far north of Greenland, just a few hundred miles from the, from the North Pole. And I'm interested in glaciers, what glaciers are doing at the moment, what they did in the past, and what they can tell us about climate change. So what I want to start with is sort of this question of what is climate? We hear a lot about climate, we hear a lot about weather, but the difference between the two isn't always so obvious. And, and the sort of, you can think about this yourself, what, what climate means to you, but the, the key definition is that climate is effectively the long-term average of weather, normally over at least 30 years. So full disclosure, I'm, I turned 34 a few days ago. I would only, if I lived in one place, I would only just about now be able to tell what the climate of the UK is if I was going based on my observations. Um, it's not how it feels one year to the next year. It's over longer periods. And normally this is to do with things like temperature, humidity, pressure, wind, and precipitation. So they're the sort of things it's not, it's the, the way I like to think about it. Weather might be that today it's a bit sunny, but it's a bit haily, it's a bit cold. If I go outside, I'll wear, I'll wear a jacket, some trousers. Tomorrow it might be very, very wet. I'll wear a waterproof, take an umbrella. The day after it might be very warm, I'll wear shorts. That's weather. That's not sort of what we're thinking about. Climate is more, when I look in my wardrobe, what do I have? I have a selection of cold jackets, but I also have shorts because we have in Britain a, a sort of climate that allows, allows it to be fairly mild, but also fairly cold. It's not like somewhere like Canada or Iceland where it is pretty cold for a lot of the year. So that's, that's how to, a way to think about climate. So, so climate change, which I'm sure you all know and have heard of, is defined as a long-term shift in global or regional 
uh, climate patterns. So we can talk about global climate change or regional climate change. Both of those are, are perfectly fine to discuss. And it's not always climate change can be natural, which we'll come on to, but it also can be what we call anthropogenic or human caused. And climate change nowadays, if you hear that term, normally it refers to the change or the rise in global temperatures we've experienced since sort of the last hundred years or so. That's what it means on a sort of day-to-day -day basis if you see it in the news. And the one of the issues with climate change, issues or complexities is it is going to cause, well, it already is affecting a huge number of people. So islands in the Pacific who are, are literally flooding and going to be underwater. It's already one of the biggest drivers of migration in the world, if not the biggest climate change migrants who are moving from sort of hot rural areas towards cities where they uh, can take advantage of air conditioning and living indoors. Um, obviously, in the US, we have some uh, political sort of difficulties which have now change back the other way and the US has, has re-signed into the sort of global climate accord and people like Greta Thunberg who are doing a lot for, for sort of school level and young people to show that you can have a voice uh, and you can see someone like Leonardo DiCaprio calling Greta Thunberg a, a leader of our time. Um, but there's also other sides to it so this is a, a quite a famous example of the National Geographic put this photo out of this polar bear starving saying this is what climate change looks like um, and effectively had to issue an apology because despite the fact that it's possible this polar bear is starving because of climate change, it can't access food, it shouldn't be in this very grassy, non-snowy landscape. It was viewed by billions of people and even though they had this clip, there's no evidence that it was explicitly due to climate change. So there's this sort of balance of being too sensational versus the political side versus also realising that climate change is the... it's the defining issue of our time, really. If we don't do something about it soon, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. But I want to talk a bit more broadly about, about what's going on, what has been going on with the climate, um, and then at the end, sort of looking a bit to the future. So one of the key things to remember, and much of this, hopefully you, you might know this already from uh, different classes, you've taken different subjects, but Earth's climate is naturally variable. It's fluctuated over billions of years. Uh, during Earth's existence, mainly due to how we orbit the sun, so how far we are from the sun. Um, and this is vital because the sun is where we get most of our energy from. It's the main external factor giving us energy in the terms of uh, heat, mostly. Um, and this varies over time. And you can see we're over here. Uh, this is sort of a slightly squished scale, but it goes back to half a billion years. And you can see it's been warmer. That's not something scientists deny, whereas people say oh, it's been warmer in the past, so it's fine. Uh, and it's been colder in the past. Um, and in the sort of recent period we've had, this period, which is called the Holocene, it's been fairly stable. We had some glaciations here where Britain, so me in Liverpool, uh, Martin in Wales, people in Scotland, and sort of the north of England would have been covered by at least a kilometre of ice. And then we had this sort of warm, clement, nice period. And then recently we've had this kind of upturn where we've had temperatures increasing very rapidly. And... I won't go into this in detail, but if you're, you're interested in why the Earth's climate have these changes, and you can see some of these, these are quite cyclical, you know, they sort of go up and down like you would with a nice, a nice sort of wave. This change is based on how the Earth goes around the sun. So not necessarily the sun moving, but if the Earth is uh, in a sort of very round or elliptical orbit. So in summit, in the sort of the, the red example here, we're always a similar distance from the sun. Here we get closer and further away how tilted the earth is. So it tilts between 22 and 24 uh, degrees of tilt um, and how wobbly the earth is on its axis. And all these things affect how much energy the earth gets and which part of the earth gets energy. So when the Northern hemisphere, for example, is quite cold, uh, ice sheets grow. When it's a bit warmer, there's no ice sheets like we have now, there's, a, there's only the Greenland ice sheet. And just in, in case this wasn't uh, clear, so this is the average annual warming we have compared to pre-industrial. So compared to before we started pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and below are sort of the, um, the differences in seasons, but at the top here we have the annual average warming. And you can see if it's blue, it means there's cooling. 
there's very little blue almost ever apart from the what's called the atlantic blob or cool spot um has a bit of cooling but most of the world is warming in some places by up to three degrees in a lot of the arctic which i'll come on to by over two degrees but in most places between sort of zero and 1.5 um, and this relates late to later what i'll talk about with the the goal we have for sticking to 1.5 degrees c but you can see we have have warming there's there's apart from if you sort of decide to ignore a lot of the evidence, there is clear evidence for global warming uh, and climate change. And these are projections going forward. So hopefully you've heard about sort of some of the, the damage that's being done. And we have these different uh, RCPs, which are sort of pathways which we as a society can take, depending on what we do to the uh, atmosphere. If we pump more CO2 out or if we stop driving cars, stop flying, stop producing, coal and so on. Um, and you can see we are currently sort of here um, but, and these are still together because we're kind of at the same point and we're just at about one degree C of warming. Um, this is where we have this sort of choice. If we stick, we sort of stop emitting and we go to this lower path or we continue what we're doing and we carry on to this higher path where somewhere between sort of three and five degrees of warming. Um, so we're at this point where things could go very badly wrong if we don't do something. And a lot of these figures are from the IPCC who produce beautiful detailed figures. Um, one, this is one which I show to a lot of my students. This is basically showing how much of uh, the warming we're seeing is due to natural versus human uh, impacts. Because that's the other thing. So it's all natural, it's changed in the past. This is just something we haven't realized yet. Um, where it's blue, there is the possibility for it to cause a cooling. Um, and these are all human causes. So here we have greenhouse gases, CO2, then we have methane, nitrous oxide, halo carbons. We have ozone, which we're emitting, surface albedo, so that's a change in land use, uh, removal of, of sort of snow that melts, cutting down of forests. Um, all these things are, are human impacts and they cause um, basically all of these red bars and some, some blue bars, but mainly red, so adding warmth to the atmosphere. Below here we have the natural ones, so this is natural, solar irradiance, change in how much energy we get from the sun, and it's, it's tiny. So this is total natural versus total anthropogenic, which is human cause, and you can see the difference. So the increase in temperature in the earth is effectively is caused by human activity, whether we, we like it or not, the evidence is very clear. And the scientists have said that the confidence that human activities specifically are increasing uh, the heat of the Earth's surface has reached what they call a five sigma level. That's how a uh, level of confidence. And that means there is only one in a million chance that the warming um, is not caused by humans. So a, a tiny, tiny amount. So just bear that in mind that the scientists have a one in a million chance that they're wrong effectively. Um, I'll talk briefly a bit about the Arctic. So I'm most interested in the Arctic, which is the area above 66.6 .6 degrees north. So sort of from the top of Iceland upwards. Um, and in the last 50 years, the air temperature in the Arctic has increased by at least two degrees C, um, twice as fast as the rest of the Earth. Um, this, the reason for this isn't still really known. It's called Arctic amplification. So the Arctic amplifies the warming the rest of the world sees. Um, but the reason for it is still a, still a bit hazy, but it's to do with sort of atmospheric processes. And this is a big problem because there's lots of nice stuff in the Arctic that we like. Um, and if we look going forwards, these are these two um, graphs I showed you before, these ones. And uh, this is for the Northern Hemisphere. So we have sort of, we're at 2021 in here, and this is at the end of the century. So it could go up to about six, maybe stay as low as about two. This is for the Northern Hemisphere. For the Arctic, on the same scale, things are looking pretty bad. Um, at the best, if we stick to this very nice pathway, they're looking at about six degrees of warming. Uh, at the worst, up to 12, 13. Uh, so just compare, it's almost sort of double the, double the height, which is pretty scary. I mean, the, the errors are still big, which is good. We could maybe come down to here, which is only four, but four degrees of warming is, is still pretty bad. One of the reasons I care about this and why I'm interested is because the Arctic has a lot of glasses. So 
glaciers are everywhere they're amazing if you haven't been to see a glacier hopefully you will at some point in your lifetime um they're they're wonderful and they still exist currently on all continents just about there's a few on uh, in africa on mount kilimanjaro mount kenya i believe and some of the mountains around there uh, they're obviously around south america north america through europe in the alps and pyrenees and so on in um, the himalaya uh, and up in the north in norway Svalbard, iceland and so on <coughs> excuse me 90 percent of these have been retreating uh, since the 20th century and some of them have completely disappeared and we're particularly worried because if greenland disappeared greenland ice sheet melted it would raise global sea level by seven meters which is uh catastrophic like we would be absolutely catastrophic for human civilization um antarctica if it melted could raise sea level by about 60 meters so obviously even even worse the, these things aren't going to happen overnight but it's worth bearing in mind um that the more warming we do the more sea level is going to rise from these as well as all these other small independent glaciers as well and they're adding sea level all the time and Whilst at the moment that's not a problem and we sit in a, a relatively privileged place in the UK, we have we have some coastal places, coastal cities, um, but we're not really that close to the sea level compared to places like Bangladesh, which are, are already experiencing huge amounts of flooding, um, or uh, some of the islands that I mentioned earlier in the Pacific. That's where the impact's really, really going to be felt straight away uh, and already is. And it really matters. So this is a, a very recent or a few, it's a few years old now paper, but with a recent model showing Antarctica, if you didn't know, this is what Antarctica looks like with the South Pole in the middle, with different uh, sort of climate scenarios. So the very nice one where we stop emitting versus the, the bad one where we melt a lot of it. And you can see the brown here is land, basically Antar West Antarctica completely disappears and we have this small thing left. And the difference between these scenarios or in these lines here. So how much sea level it adds to it. If we really do a good job, it will add next to nothing. If we do a really bad job by the end of sort of in a several hundred years, so not our lifetimes, we're going to see sort of 12 or so meters of sea level just from Antarctica, which again is, is even though it's a long time away, it's catastrophic for humans. So what I'm interested in, I'm just going to give you a very quick example um, is sort of what I look for in the past, and I work a lot in Greenland, um, and here are the climate stripes um, for the Arctic, and you can see it's a, a slightly different picture here. We have this warmer period in the past, um, and then it got colder in the, in the more recent past, and then it got warmer again when we started causing uh, warming. So this is over a thousand years, I should say. It's not, uh, it's not 2000 years, as it says here. Below is the 2000 year record, and you can see here that the Arctic temperature here is it stayed quite high, then it got colder, and then it's gone higher again. And we're now at a point because this is from 2000, and um, the, the record ends. We're now at a point sort of up here, which is higher than any point in the past 2000 years. So it's, it's changed quite a lot over the past few thousand years. And what I'm interested in is we, we see these stories that glaciers, sea ice are melting, and it's very, very bad. But an important sort of thing to understand and, and place is, is this rate different to what's happened in the past? Because if, if we don't know how much things changed in the past, there's no way to really look at what we see now and place that in any sort of framework. Otherwise, it's just like, OK, it's, it's retreating, but maybe that has always happened. We don't know. Um, and I'm kind of interested in how big the Greenland ice sheet and the glaciers around it used to be when it got smaller because it, it's smaller than it was 50 years ago 100 years ago why did it get smaller so was it was it because of ocean temperatures air temperatures sea level rise and um, which which part has actually caused it to get smaller and will all glaciers do the same thing and this is something which is is hard to to answer because we kind of well we kind of know the answer is no glaciers will respond very differently uh, it's very, very based on local factors, uh, but it's important we understand that. So if we find one glacier that's advancing or not retreating, we know, OK, it's not telling us that climate change isn't happening, but it's just that something strange is going on. And if we can understand that, we can tell more about um, more about the environment and how glaciers respond. 
Um, so, I mean, part of why I do the field work is because, of, uh, but why I do sort of geography, sorry, is because of the field work, I get to go to some amazing places. So as I was uh, coring a lake with a musk ox here, which is like a kind of Greenlandic bison type thing. Um, they're very funny. Um, it just stared at us, quite scary, very big. And this is on a, a boat we hired from a fisherman, which had a few uh, leaky holes and we had to repair. Uh, flying to Greenland in these, well, while we're in Greenland, flying around Greenland, these fun planes, and then helicopters to get to some of the harder to find places. Um, and I use a number of different sampling techniques and methods to understand past climate change, which I'm not going to go into now. I don't, I don't want to bore you too much with that, but, but it's very good fun. And um, this is us coring a lake, so taking mud from the bottom of a lake to take back to the lab and see what's happened in that lake over the past sort of 10, 20,000 years. Uh, we also measure rivers, so you can see this is a, a river in front of a glass here. It's called, the, the river here is called Red River, which if you can't tell, it's because this is a sort of reddy brown color uh, from all the mud coming from under the glacier. And we also take uh, rock samples. So this is on this beautiful island called Carrot Island, which is, I think here we're about a thousand meters above sea level, directly dropping down, taking rock samples to see how long this, uh, this island has been exposed uh, to the atmosphere. And this is, a, this is an example from um, a place in Northeast Greenland, just showing some of the, the field work we do. So this is where we went to Cora Lake. So similar to this, but when it was frozen. So you can see us digging through the snow, then digging through the ice and putting a core down to get this beautiful uh, sediment out. And from this, we get this beautiful suite of wiggly lines, uh, which basically tell us through interpretation when the glacier advanced and retreated, advanced and retreated. Um, and once we understand how old that is, we can uh, work out something about what caused it to advance. Was it advancing because of air temperature or something completely different? Um, and again, I won't go into detail, but we can link that to other records from around Greenland or more widely. So we can match what our wiggle says to other wiggles. So wiggle showing us temperature from the northern hemisphere, from the Arctic, from Greenland specifically, uh, from the ocean currents, uh, from sort of productivity. So how, how much um, organic material there was, how many sort of beasties there were walking around. Um, eating mud and, and regurgitating it and then also to some of the other uh, records of sort of glacier growth from the area and um, so that's just a very very quick uh, example if you if you're into mud then definitely this is a, a great subject for you one of the one things this is another um this is an island called disco island which is a great name uh, to an ice cap we worked on which is a sort of interesting story we did a, some work on the past of, of of this ice cap how big it used to be but we also did some modeling to understand what's going to happen to it in the future. So modeling is basically where you represent the, the glacier using a computer model. And basically we grew the glacier and the glacier is the, the colored stuff sitting on a contour map. So you, this is kind of a bigger version of this ice cap. Um, and we compared it to other model, other sort of data to see how it fits. And basically we could model the, the height above uh, height above sea level, its velocity, so how fast the ice is moving and how thick it is from sort of 1750 to when this study was done, 2015. And you can see it gets a lot smaller, which is quite sad. And also importantly, the velocity, blue is basically not moving, the yellow and red is moving quite quickly. When we get to 2015, apart from this bit here, none of it basically is moving, which is very bad for a glacier. And red means it's lost a lot of thickness, it's getting thinner. And basically, we unfortunately showed that in the future, it's basically doomed. You can see by 2030, which is now not many years ago, it's all blue. It's not moving at all. Uh, and it's all red down here. It's all losing thickness. And we basically unfortunately found that even, even if we cool the atmosphere by uh, 0.1 of a degree per decade, this ice cap is going to disappear by sort of 2080. Um, so unless we do something dramatic, which is this yellow line, which isn't going to happen, unfortunately, the, the ice cap is unfortunately doomed. And it's one of those sad things that a lot of the glaciers we see that are melting now are, are going to disappear. Um, it's just a matter of time. Um, because while we see things really quickly, we're in this sort of very, very second to second 
very connected i can speak to you through a computer from somewhere else completely from where you are or you can watch this later the natural system moves a lot more slowly it has to respond and if you think about this huge mass of ice it takes a long time for it to respond to to the climate it doesn't happen within seconds it happens within decades so a lot of the glaciers around the world are unfortunately already doomed we're just waiting for them to melt away um and not to be too doom and gloomy, but just to, to, to show you in sort of what we're doing in the future or what we should be doing. Um, we obviously have some pledges which most countries in the world are signed up to. And we have the COP26 uh, in Glasgow, which is coming up soon, which is this big next conference to try and sort of set more targets and see what people are doing. And we're here at the moment, this black line. And you can see here that we have certain pledges we've made um as countries which if we stick to we will limit it to 2.6 to 3.2 degrees of warming the ipcc and the countries have said we should try and stick to 1.5 or 2 degrees c at the worst okay so obviously there's a bit of a gap here um so there's still more work to do in addition the actual policies we have so the policies that different governments are bringing in only is going to limit the warming to 3.1 to 3.7. So we pledge to have this, but actually the policies are only here. And if we don't do anything, basically the baseline, we're going to be up here. So we're getting there. The pledges are in the right ballpark, but we need to bring it down more. Um, and just to show you, this is uh, lost that one. This is this is where we're at uh, three years ago, I believe. The pledges um, were at 3.2 which is not great. And the current policies are at 3.4, so that's these two. We're now a bit lower. So now the pledges have been brought down to just less than three degrees C. I don't have the figure because I think it was released yesterday or the, or the day before. Um, but we're actually doing better than we were before. But it still remains that we need to make sure what we're doing, our targets as countries. So unfortunately, it's we, we as individuals can't do that much. Our, our countries actually do that. So. This is a, a sort of um, like table showing if the targets are good. So if the target is good for 1.5 or 2 degrees C, or if it's not good enough, and if the policies are meeting the target. So you have this target and you're going to meet it with your policies. The only countries which are achieving that are Gambia, Ethiopia, and India. Okay, they're the only three countries in the world where their policies and their targets are good. Countries where they have good targets, but the policies aren't good enough for these. Countries where the target is just simply not good enough uh, are here. You can see some huge countries, China, uh, one of the biggest uh, contributors, uh, Russia and Japan, big, uh, big countries as well. Um, and they have, tar they have their policies are doing well, but it's not good enough for the targets. And then the weak targets and weaker actions. So the target's not good enough and the action they're taking isn't good enough are all of these. So the USA um, fits in there. Um, some other big countries, the European Union, which we were until recently grouped with, also sits in there. But basically, you can see that the list of countries here is huge and includes some very, very big, very, very polluting countries. Um, and we effectively, we need to bring these countries up towards the top left here, which hopefully some of the sort of new policies will do. And I want to just mention very, very quickly some sort of uh, a more common thread which people are picking up, especially young people, sort of uh, pre-university people, is the idea of eco or climate anxiety and the idea that this helplessness where you feel there's nothing you can do about it and you're going to inherit what's happening. And it's something which can be kind of uh, paralyzing. And we have chats with our students about this, about what can you do? How can you make, how can you feel better about this? Because you don't want to be overwhelmed by it. Um, and there's lots of resources online. I just wanted to highlight some here, but it's really worth uh, Googling it to see some things about steps you can take to deal with it, because it's a, a, a real problem going forward. I think that lots of people will, will struggle um, with the feeling of doom and gloom. Um, and instead we can hopefully try and change it into a, a happier message. Cool. So. Thank you very much. That was a very, very whistle stop tour of um, sort of some parts of climate change, some parts of climate science, some parts of what I do. Um, and as I said, if you do have any questions after this, do send me an email. Um, 
I work at LJMU for the geography and the climate change degrees there. Uh, so I'd be happy to take any questions or any advice on anything like that, uh, if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Um, I found that absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've got a question for yeah, you. Yeah. I was making notes. Of that. Obviously, kind of the UK over, let's say, the last 20 years, the number of flooding incidents has, has risen. Uh, the, the amount of coastal erosion that we see um, it is increasing as well. Um, and I just wondered how much of, it, of that is down to climate change. Is that entirely down to climate change and the retreat of the glaciers, or is there something else going on as well? So for, for the UK, I'm not sure um, fully, but I mean, it until, well, until, until sort of a year ago, the projections for sort of flood events and increases in hurricanes and all these sorts of natural hazards, or, or a lot of those sorts of natural hazards, weather related, they, it's very, very hard to directly link them to climate change. Um, it was understood that a lot of them would get not met, not necessarily more of them, but more intense. So when there was a flood event, it would be more intense than it used to be. The, the, the sort of height of flooding would be higher than it was previously. Um, but research is kind of, it's, it's one of those things it's hard to do until the floods or whatever happen. And then you can look at it and be like, okay, that was due to this climatological factor. Um, but I think research this year has kind of come out and said, no flooding and hurricane incidents are increasing in number as well as intensity so definitely some of it's caused by that um, and i mean i guess with coastal erosion as well definitely from sea level rise where we're seeing that partly in the uk we have a sort of there's a, a playoff where parts of scotland are still actually sea levels dropping as a, a result of the ice sheets melting so in the south of england we sort of have increasing sea levels whereas in in scotland we have dropping sea level so it's a bit more complicated but I think some of the instances can definitely be attributed to it how many I'm not sure but going forwards it will probably be a larger and larger percentage okay and I was going to ask you how confident do you think that we as a, a world as a global population can turn this around or stop the increase are you, are you confident that governments are are now taking this seriously and yeah you know, we will think, be in a better yeah i'm more confident than i was before i mean i think one of like the the importance of biden in the us and them rejoining uh can't really be understated because it's not i mean they are huge polluters but also it's more of a, a symptomatic the us which is like one of the biggest economies in the world not following and not really caring about climate policies is a huge message to other places. Why should we try if they're not? Um, and I think the, the difficulty is we get, we're getting there with renewable energy. There's still a lot to do. Um, and in the UK, at least, I find a lot of it's put on the consumer. So, you know, it's sort of, okay, um, you now can't buy petrol cars or diesel cars everything has to be electric but at the moment electric cars are very expensive and there's no infrastructure for them so it's this it's this slowly getting there and the government has a lot of talk about some of the policies but i think we're still at least in the uk to see where that's going to come um and i mean there were the more pledges made last week about this sort of thing so i think they are taking it seriously um around the globe and we are definitely going in the right direction and the sort of the numbers are dropping, which is good. Um, and the sort of hope people have is, is higher. Um, but I think it's one of those, I think we need to keep pushing for sort of everything to be zero. And then if we get close to that, that's still pretty good and achievable because if we just let things carry on, it's gonna be very, very bad. So I'm hopeful as we, as we kind of go on, it will, it will be okay. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. No problem. Uh, we're now going to move on to um, a presentation by Lucan Rosales um, from Amity University. Um, unfortunately, she can't be with us this afternoon, but I have her contribution via the wonder of video. 
And so if I can work out how to share my screen, we shall start her presentation. Um, hello and welcome to today's session. My name is Luján Rosales and I work for Amity. I graduated last year um, having studied international relations at Queen Mary University of London. And today I'm going to be talking to you um, a little bit about geography and why um, it's great to choose it as a career path and why you should perhaps consider studying uh, geography as a degree in university. Um, as I'm aware that many of you um, will probably uh, currently be thinking about your A-levels and what universities and degree to apply for. So hopefully this session um, is of some use to you, um, I hope. So um, at the moment, for those of you who are studying geography, um, you will, I'm sure, um, be aware that you will be looking at both physical and human geography, or perhaps um, you have just started, so you might not be familiar with um, what both of these categories entail. So if, for example, you are currently studying physical geography, then you will be learning about glacial and coastal systems, water and carbon cycle, um, and hazards and ecosystems under stress. Similarly, you'll also be undertaking studies in human geography, where you'll be looking at resource security, such as water security, um, energy and oil management, and renewable energy. You'll also be looking at global governance and systems, such as, for example, studying <clears throat> globalization, trade links and partnerships, and emerging markets, such as um, the development and emergement of BRIC countries. And you'll also be looking probably at changing places, migration, and all um, sorts of things. Um, you, part of your A-levels, are also to take um, part in coursework, you know, developing your own research question um, in either human or physical geography. Uh, and this is all, of course, your choice. But I'm sure um, most of you already know this, uh, especially if you're taking geography at A-level. So moving from what you are currently um, or will currently be doing at geography A level, uh, it's important to start thinking beyond the A levels. And by this, I mean, um, start thinking about developing perhaps a career or um, emerging yourself into a geography related degree. So perhaps, you know, you might be asking yourself, why do I want to study geography? And most people think that studying geography um, you know, it's it's about studying rocks and the weather and hazards. And of course, this is part of it, but geography um, is much more than this. You know, it helps us to tackle many issues um, that are currently affecting the world right now. Things to do with international relations, conflict management, the water crisis, climate change. And, you know, this development and this knowledge that you acquire from studying geography um, is essential for future planning, mitigation and adaptation um, and to target future threats that can affect our environment. So by studying geography, essentially, you develop a lot of um, skills and you learn a lot of, um, about uh, environmental, social, economic and political issues um, that are affecting and could possibly affect our world now and in the future. So why, why should you choose to um, continue studying geography and carrying on to learning about it in university? So choosing a geography degree. So as, as I mentioned in the last slide, um, a geography degree essentially gives you many skills um, and knowledge, knowledge on issues um, such as what I just discussed of climate change, migration, um, inequalities and these you know are issues that you will of course um, be seeing in the news um, on a day-to-day -day basis so these are um, issues um, that are currently everywhere in the world you know even for example take uh, the coronavirus pandemic you know um, through studying geography you you gain so much knowledge uh, about, uh, for example, governance, you know, governance plays a key vital role in um, managing and tackling um, the current pandemic. 
you know, the development of partnerships um, and, and establishing um, communicating links between countries uh, to achieve a goal. Similarly, you know, when you study geography um, as a degree, you, you learn a lot about management because um, basically pretty much every single um, geography degree you, you have to take um, part in field work um, like you do in a level, but it's just much more um, in depth. But um, this, you know, gives you uh, insight into many, many transferable skills um, that you can use in different careers. And these skills, uh, of course, they're transferable. So by this, I mean to say that um, by studying a geography degree, you are not limited to a career, um, let's say a meteorologist, um, you know, or a geography teacher, secondary school teacher. The What is very um, important, you know, and what's great about studying geography is that due to the large variety of knowledge that you acquire and the large scope of subjects um, entailed within this degree allows you to go into almost any any sector um, whether you want to focus on um, finance or economics um, to becoming a diplomat or even an environmental architect you know there's a wide range of career paths that you can um, take that are not always geography related you know, you might be thinking I'm, I'm considering taking geography as a degree in university because I genuinely, I don't know, um, I am passionate about learning about glacial um, systems and how these have shaped the environment and, you know, geographical regions all around the world. But also, you know, uh, in my case, having taken geography as an A-level, uh, when I started studying about global governance and geopolitics, I decided to change my degree option. So I had um, originally applied to study international management uh, because I was very driven by the study of economics. However, um, my learning and, and the knowledge I acquired from my geography A-levels um, led me to changing my mind literally on the day that I received my A-levels and I changed degree to international relations. Um, and, you know, you may be asking why not geography as a whole, and this is because, you know, um, with geography, as you're aware, you've got either human or physical geography, uh, and for me, you know, there was a very specific area within human geography that I wanted to focus on, and that was geopolitics, um, and so I found that international relations was the closest thing to um, a degree in geopolitics because I did research for um, a bachelor's degree, specifically in geopolitics, and all that came up was international relations. Um, so, so, so essentially, um, you know, it's depending uh, on what you're passionate about, um, geography can open many, many doors. And, you know, if you're, especially if you're not sure about what you want to study, you know, um, what's really special about this degree is that you get to choose a lot of your modules, which, you know, a lot of other um, degrees don't have this choice. And of course, um, this is all subject to the university you're applying to. And so it's important that you do your research prior to applying to any degree, just so you are 100% sure um, as to where what your options are. So um, I briefly touched on this um, throughout the presentation, but you know, the value of a geography degree, um, I personally, and, and most people uh, focus on two areas, which is the transferable skills that you acquire from this degree, and the wide range of career choices um, associated with studying geography at university. So, um, as mentioned before, you develop um, a lot of teamwork and project management, and this is mainly through field work. Uh, and what's really cool um, about studying geography at universities is that uh, a lot of universities do offer terms abroad. So uh, you can go and study in Australia, you know, New York. Um, so that's that's some, that's very cool. If you had con previously considered a degree that you get to travel, geography, you certainly do. There's a lot of field trips. Um, 
And so you get to make a lot of friends and develop a lot of teamwork, communication and listening skills, which are very uh, valuable and in high demand. You also develop a lot of research and analytical skills. And this is, of course, um, through your own research. Um, when you know when you um, take part and when you carry out your um, coursework um, and a lot of critical thinking and problem solving and this is particularly because um, as I mentioned before you will be looking at a lot of contemporary modern issues affecting uh, the world right now and um, as geographers, you know, you're encouraged to find solutions to issues such as the water crisis, um, you know, resource scarcity, um, alternatives to the use of oil or uh, finding uh, more energy efficient resources. So it's all about finding solutions to current problems. So if you are someone who's passionate about making a change um, and positively impacting the future, then geography might, might as well be um, a possible degree choice. In terms of um, career choices, you can, as I mentioned before, you're not bound to studying geography um, related and um, immersing yourself in geography related careers. So, of course, you know, some obvious ones would be astronomer, meteorologist, um, sustainability planner, um, sustainable management, things like that, but you can also um, become a development or international aid worker, you know, working for charities and non-governmental organizations. You can also um, develop a career in the emerging market that is of renewable energy, um, which is um, very associated with um, human security, especially if you will know this if you're studying uh, resource um, scarcity uh, at a level right now and you could also um, go into the politics sector so become a political risk analyst uh, or a sustainability consultant and it's important to know that this is just a couple you know um, there are tons of options you know geography is a basic degree that allows you to go into almost any energy sector, even become an environmental lawyer. Um, but there's tons of options. And depending on the university that you apply to, they will also help you um, with um, career choices and um, help you learn about what you can do with this degree. So um, a final note to touch on is what you can expect from um, a geography degree. So um, this is, of course, very dependent on um, the subject area of geography. You know, a lot of people um, may choose to study geography as a whole, um, covering the entire subject. So in that case, you know, you will have different modules um, that are focused on either human or physical geography and a bit of both. Um, but other people do um, want to narrow it down um, and might want to focus uh, on studying simply human geography or physical geography, depending on what you're passionate about. For me, I found that um, my, I wanted to go even um, deeper. So within the human geography category, I, there was, you know, my passion laid with geopolitics. But and that's where I wanted to focus. So I found that international relations was the closest thing to that. You know, I didn't um, want to really be studying anything else but that. I wanted to really specialize in that area. So perhaps, you know, that's something that you might consider if there's a specific area within either category that you want to um, further expand your learning. So um, talking on a general geography degree, you know, from um, different universities, um, you you always have to carry out field research. Um, it is definitely very coursework based, but there's also um, assessments uh, and exams and essays. And you have a lot of uh, choice when it comes to uh, what modules you can choose from, which is which is great. You know, um, a lot of the modules that you can choose can vary from global environmental issues. So if you're someone who's passionate about the environment, climate change, uh, and really want to be part of the solution, then this might be a module that you you might want to choose. Um, 
there's also others such, such water development um, and again um, things like globalization but this um, will really depend on the university and what module choices they offer so again um, it's important that you carry out uh, research on your own you know um, and choose uh, the best option for you uh, according to what um, that degree offers so i hope that this has um, clarified a bit what you can expect from studying geography um, at university and what your choices are for you know after you you take a degree in geography Brilliant. Uh, hopefully, um, Tim's still there with us. Yes. Um. Uh, I mean, one of the things I think it's worth pointing out <clears throat> after that pre presentation, and I don't know the figures specific to geography, but 50% of graduates often go on to a career that's not related to their degree. So I think that thing about the transferable skills that a degree can offer you is really important, although you might not end up working in that particular field. Um, <clears throat> but I was interested, that, I mean, one of the things there that was mentioned was there's a combination of coursework and sometimes exams. And I know it's difficult for you to know what every university in the country will offer, but just taking Liverpool John Moores as an example, what, what's the kind of split on that? So we, I think, yeah, like, like you said, it's firstly, yeah, I think a lot of our students, some students stay in, in geography, but the skills we give them can be used for so many careers and kind of linked to that. We, we use some exams, but I'd say we are even progressively moving away from them for, for many of the modules because we we can kind of deliver more interesting assessment types so i mean we we use maybe maybe the students maybe have two exams per year for their entire course the rest is is sort of poster presentations they give presentations reports essays um maps they have to submit small bits of analysis small sort of multiple choice tests we try to keep it as varied as possible and especially towards the final years we try to make it uh, where relevant or where sort of appropriate linked to careers. So, for example, there's a module um, that a colleague runs, which is on environmental pollution. And for that uh, module, the students have to provide a summary report to a stakeholder. So it could be, for example, a, a farmer owns some land and is wondering why that why the river is yellow some days and if it's poisonous and if it's going to damage their uh, their livestock and things like that. So they have to look into the data, analyze it, interpret it, but then also um, turn it into something that someone who isn't a scientist can read, which is a, a hugely important skill. And then presentations as well. When our students come in the first year, they the idea of standing up in front of staff and their peers and presenting is terrifying. Um, and I, when I was a student, I hated it. It was the the worst thing I'd ever done at university was having to present and now I lecture in front of people without worrying about it and, and that's nice because you can really see students who maybe at the start are not that confident but they're very they're very intelligent and they clearly know what they're talking about they progress and they get to the end and they're giving these amazing talks not looking at the powerpoint just doing it without a script uh, and that's another ridiculously transferable skill really really easy to to show in almost any job application why that would be useful um so yeah we we still have a few exams because they do test some important things i think uh but overall we've kind of moved away from that and we have lots of practical activities and sort of test the students that way yeah i i think that's important for people to realize because there's so much particularly from the current government on the importance of exams and how exams mm. are best, and particularly we've seen A levels and GCSEs put back because of the pandemic. And yet, when you get into higher education, 
there's kind of a realization, I would say, from most academics that exams aren't maybe the best way to yeah. your knowledge and understand. yeah, because they test a they test a very specific suite of skills, which is for some students very good, and some students are very good at memorizing information which is relevant to a question, but then also because you don't know what you may have, maybe you've, you've had a course on, on rivers and you don't know which part of that the exam is going to ask you on. So it, obviously it's not just memorizing text, but it does test something, but we find, and I'm not sure if it's just our students or, also, or, or lots of students, but some of our students don't excel in those sorts of environments. And we, we would sort of sit down and think, okay, where after university are they going to be told you're not allowed to look at any information and you have to write something important in two hours and it's just it's it's completely unrealistic and while while maybe the idea of a bit of time pressure and having to produce something is valuable um it's an unrealistic situation apart from if they're going on to sort of entrance exams for another for a job or something like that that we we can test them on far more interesting skills and allow them to kind of, I mean, it's this point of saying it's no point in having students which, who, who perform worse than they sort of deserve to just because they're not very good at exams. Um, so we try and balance it out. So it means that all students can sort of achieve what they do best. Um, and we, we run a field trip, not in, in sort of normal times to Iceland. And that's where we find, I think, linked to, to geography being a practical subject, the students excel because they get to be themselves and spend time with with the staff and other students and when we assess them there in the field it's 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 brilliant you really see them some come to life whereas if we had sit them down and asked them to write an essay on or an exam essay on on glaciation of iceland they they might not necessarily interact with that as more, much whereas if they're in the field seeing these beautiful things they're, they're very engaged and they invariably do better I mean, one of the things that struck me when I went to university was asking that was being asked to do group work. And I wondered whether you have any of that as a form of assessment. Yeah, you? so we, we do quite a lot of it for a few. I mean, for field work and practicals, partly because just of logistics, it's if you're in the field, we can't give everybody their own individual piece of equipment and we get you to work as a group. And a lot of it is formative assessed. So it doesn't count towards your grade. It's just, okay, you're going to spend three hours looking at this, then give us a quick presentation, no pressure of what you've done. And it's more to give them some feedback on that. Then we do some group work that's assessed through all years, be it poster presentations, practicals they do together or, or presentations as a group. And, um, there's invariably tensions with that because students find they're like, well, I, I, I did this, I did more than my peers and this person didn't even turn up. Um, and it's fairly easy to assess. We have sort of a built in peer assessment system where all the students anonymously fill in how they feel it went. So if everybody contributed and then um, it's kind of that not automatic, but semi, semi automatically sort of highlights if there's OK, five out of the six people said Martin didn't bother turning up for any of the sessions as if that would happen. And then you have to, and then we can, we can be like, okay, let's investigate that. Whereas if it's one person is complaining, whereas everyone else is happy, then you can tell. So, so we've tried to make it more fair through there because we can, we, you can see, and it's, it's harder now with, with COVID online, but group work has been very valuable for that. And it's kept the students connected I think we put them in breakout rooms and you go in and they're chatting about whatever task they have and they're all doing different things uh, so it's really really helped during everything being online but in person when you're there you can you can see who's not pulling their weight and you can see they kind of learn from each other and it's really really important I think and virtually for every career that you would go for I can't think of really yeah. any careers that wouldn't involve some form of teamwork so it's yeah. a really important skill yeah and I mean when we when we do our sort of careers sort of chats they you know the sort of um the the normal questions which might come up at a generic interview so many of them are like okay when's a time when you've had to lead a group or be part of a group or how do you work as a group so 
the more experience we can give them when they can say, oh, we had to do this project on this and I hated it, but I managed to contribute or I had to do this group and my group were useless, but I managed to motivate them and lead them or anything like that. There's, I think most of the sort of examples that students get of how they've, how they've sort of overcome obstacles isn't I sat at home and wrote an essay. It's, oh, we were in Iceland in a snowstorm and one of my group wasn't feeling very well. So we had to help them out and all, all my group were working really well together. And it was, so that's where, that's where the kind of stories and the, and the skills come from, I think. And it's, it's something which, yeah, students protest about it, but I think really in the end, it's, it's very, very useful for them. And, and just a final question. I think I know what the answer is because you speak with such passion about your subject. I think last week I was running an English session and I once I ended up by thinking I want to go and study English. And I think today I think I want to go and study geography <laughs> as well. But if you had your time over again, would you pick another degree? Or no, I, was, I literally I was talking to a friend from from my undergraduate yesterday and she was saying, how oh, if she if she did a degree again she'd do something different and she did a earth sciences which is sort of geography but not quite and she was like oh would you change I was like no I don't I don't think there's like with all honesty there's no degree I'd rather do I'd, I'd maybe take different modules within geography but I would I mean I still remember all of my undergraduate lecturers some of the specific practicals we did that inspired me um, and it was the same when I was in school I I, I did it as a at a level, I was like, oh, I enjoy it. I don't know what will happen in the future, but some teacher said, do what you enjoy. So I did that. And yeah, no, I wouldn't change it at all. I, I think that's really important. And that's something I've always said to learners is the most important thing about choosing your degree subject is do you enjoy it? Because yeah. three years is a long time to spend something yeah. Studying something that maybe you don't like yeah and it's very I mean coming from from sort of college or, or school it's a very different level of um interaction with the staff you know it's it's not as not the school it's handheld but you you don't have as much contact time so if you're sat on your own in your in your flat or in your in a library having to churn out another essay on the subject you hate it, it's much harder whereas if you at least have that sort of fire it gets you to it's like okay I'm going to do some more and, and you enjoy it so yeah I definitely think it's really really important we see that with our dissertation students in their final year if they pick a project they're they're personally interested in they do amazingly well that's great I'd just like to thank um Tim again and Lucan for um submitting the video uh, and hopefully you found it useful this week. So thank you very much. Thank you.